let's cover a brief overview of the 12 requirements. Before we really dive deep into every single one of them, I just want to cover what the list is in general and give you an introduction on every single one of these. Let's take a look. The 12 requirements of the PCI DSS are, as of version 3.2.1, the first is about installing and maintaining a firewall configuration to protect your card data from traffic. Requirement 2 is about not using defaults, default passwords, default accounts, and so on, with the purpose of minimizing vulnerabilities. Requirement 3 is about protecting stored data with strong encryption and proper key management in your databases. Then, requirement 4 is about encrypting transmission of sensitive data, especially across public networks. Requirement 5 is about protecting all systems against malware as well as keeping the antivirus updated. Requirement 6 develop and maintain secure systems and applications, including security requirements in your development lifecycle, as well as applying patches in a timely manner. Requirement 7 is about restricting access to sensitive data by need to know. Minimize who has access to the data and what access every person has. Requirement 8 is about identifying in authenticating access to system components. Every person has a unique ID, they use strong authentication and other measures to make sure that every action is tracked back to the user. Requirement 9 is about restricting physical access, safely storing and moving physical media, visitor control, and so on. Requirement 10 is about tracking and monitoring all access to network and data. In other words, logging, logging, and more logging. Requirement 11 is about regular vulnerability and penetration testing of systems and processes. And finally, requirement 12 is about maintaining a policy itself that addresses information security for all personnel. Now, the original names are a bit complex. So in practice, I've simplified them, and these are the names that I'll use throughout the course. They help you memorize the requirements with less words. I call requirement number one, keep a firewall. Have proper firewall rules, restrict unknown traffic, have a firewall on all machines, and use change management for changing every firewall rule. The second requirement is no defaults. For obvious reasons, change all default passwords and all accounts, isolate servers, one functionality or one security level for server, inventory your assets, and remove all unneeded functionality. It's about minimizing obvious vulnerabilities. Requirement number three is protect stored data. It's supposed to contrast with four, which is protect transmitted data, as these are a mirror of each other. So requirement number three is about limiting the card data that you store to the essential, properly purging it once you don't need it, masking personal account numbers that are written down or stored, and having proper key encryption and key lifecycle management, key custodians, a defined crypto period, and so on. Requirement number four, as stated, is protect transmitted data. Make sure that data are encrypted with strong encryption in transit, including for public wireless networks such as satellite, GPS, GSM, as well as never sending plain text personal account numbers. Then, requirement number five is prevent malware. Very simple. Have a proper antivirus software that is regularly updated, that performs regular scans, and that outputs regular logs, and that cannot be disabled by individual users through establishing a policy. So if requirement number five is about protection from vulnerabilities that others cause, number six is about protecting yourself from the vulnerabilities that you cause. It's about developing securely. And it's not just your own applications. It's securing both off-the-shelf software and your own with regular risk ranking 
and patch installation for critical risks, but also including security requirements in the software development lifecycle and in developer training. Your developers need to be able to deal with code injections, buffer overflows, cross-site scripting, and more. The next three are related. Need to know access, identify access, and restrict physical access. This is about digital protection, this is about digital identification, and this is about physical protection. So let's start with seven. Need to know access. As the name says, it defends the principle of least privilege, or POLP. Defining user roles with the least privilege possible to perform a task. If this person can do this with less access, give them less access. If they don't need access at all to card data, then cut it off. And using access control for systems or networks, that represents this. Requirement 8 is simplified as identify access. Make sure that there are unique IDs, no shared users strong authentication, multi-factor authentication, no sharing physical access control devices, so one person can't use the badge of somebody else, and restricting database access only to administrators. Then, requirement number nine is about the physical access, entry control to rooms and critical areas, visitor distinction, for example, with color coding and proper authorization, Restricting physical access to rooms, to media, or any place with card data, and having strict policies for media storage, such as databases or USB pans, distribution policies, so if a hard drive is moved, why is it being moved, and proper training of individuals to identify tampering, for example, with POS devices. Then, requirement number 10 is simplified as monitor networks but it could be simplified as logging. It's all about logging. Logging specific events, so any event involving card data is logged. Any action taken by an admin is logged. Any intrusion attempt is logged. Every failed operation is logged, and so on. And within those specific events, there's also specific data elements that must be logged. What's the status of the operation? What's the user ID? What's the machine? And so on. Also, having one-time synchronization for all log machines to make sure that you can interpret the log timestamps from different machines in a consistent way, using file integrity monitoring to make sure that your logs are not tampered with, proper log retention. So, for example, you must keep the last year of logs in immediate log alert responses in the case of intrusions, for example. Requirement number 11 is simplified as test regularly, doing risk assessments once a year or more frequently, doing both vulnerability scanning and penetration testing. So one is more general, just about identifying vulnerabilities, while penetration testing is simulating a real-world attack and having this done by proper professionals called ASVs or authorized scan vendors, then doing regular identification of all your access points, both the legit ones and the rogue ones, having an intrusion detection system or intrusion protection system, and having file integrity monitoring on all critical files, not just logs, but other ones, such as, for example, system files. And finally, requirement number 12 is simplified as have an information security policy. It's the only requirement that is not about technology, but management. It can be considered the sum of all policies, usage policies, incident response policies, risk assessment practices, employee screening, including background checks, and others, employee roles and responsibilities, including having an owner for everything, and I mean everything, every task, every system, every network, having employee awareness, so making the policies reach these people, and proper training. Let's go one layer deeper now. And actually, each one of the requirements still has its own lesson, but let me tell you a little bit more about each of these. I want to progressively expand on every requirement so that you can progressively know more about them. So requirement number one, keep a firewall 
is overall about blocking access to the card data environment by having a firewall, but also having clear rules for inbound and outbound traffic. You'll notice the inclusion of outbound traffic. Many firewall admins focus on inbound traffic, protecting themselves from attackers. But what if the attacker is already in your network and they want to get out with data? So you need to protect yourself from inbound and outbound traffic. It's important to note that two essential documents are the network topology and the card data flows, because these clarify what must be done in terms of firewall configuration. You need the network topology to know what are the junctions that you actually need to protect with a firewall, and you need the card data flows to actually know where the card data passes through. What are the systems and networks in scope of PCI DSS compliance? But besides having these rules, it's important to have change management for them as well. For example, you may have the most sophisticated firewall ever, but then John comes and says, hey, can you whitelist this domain so that I can go online gambling? And the firewall admin says, okay. That's a very big vulnerability, okay? So there must be a documented process in a change management process for all firewall config changes. Then, requirement two is all about no defaults. It's about removing the default passwords and default accounts and default standards to block access to your systems and networks. So if you have some experience with cybersecurity, you will know that the default passwords for all types of equipment are online and anybody can find them so you need to patch these vulnerabilities. But besides the passwords and the defaults, there are other points, such as not storing multiple functionality in one server. I mean, some of them make sense, but some don't. For example, your DNS server and Active Directory server can be in the same server. They're in the same layer, but your application server and DNS server should not be in the same server. This is because if an attacker compromises a server, you want to have the least amount of functionality there, as well as disabling unnecessary functionality from systems and devices. So if you're installing a new router, you don't just need to change the password, you need to ask yourself, for every port that's open or every service, is there a reason for the service? And if there isn't, turn it off. It's about minimizing obvious vulnerabilities. Requirement number three, protect stored data. It's about, well, protecting stored data, both in databases with truncating, tokenizing, encrypting, masking, but also physical media. For example, if you have printed locks with card numbers on them, they better not be the full number. The goal is that even if the attacker obtains some of your data, those data are garbage. And effective key life cycle comes in here. So you must use strong encryption keys to begin with, but you also need to take into account the expiration of the keys, the crypto period, having key custodians, maybe split knowledge, and so on. But also, better than protecting data is to avoid storing those data in the first place. So it's about analyzing what you store and minimizing it, as well as properly purging data that you don't need anymore. It's not just about protecting the actual data, but it's about minimizing what you store, because what you don't store doesn't need to be protected. Then, if requirement three was about protecting the stored data, requirement four is about protecting the transmitted data. It's simply about maintaining encryption of data when transmitting it. So similarly, it's about using strong encryption. By the way, this is not strong authentication, strong encryption, sorry. For example, using AES-256 or 3DAS. It's important to know that this doesn't just include Wi-Fi, but mobile, Bluetooth, or any other communication modalities. And in that case, you need a standard such as WPA or WPA2, never WEP, for example. Strong encryption is mandatory. And the requirement itself dictates some good standards for this protection, like the FIPS or OSP ones. And there is a specific sub-requirement about never sending personal account numbers as plain text. 
In other words, sending a full credit card number via instant message or email. Never. Always masking them or encrypting them or some other mechanism. Remember, if an attacker gets the data, they must be garbage. Then, requirement number five is deceptively simple. Prevent malware. So, you must have an antivirus solution that is frequently updated to keep up with new malware as well as regular scans that are executed and the logs must be retained. It's also important that there should be an access control policy so that an individual user can just disable the antivirus because that will be a very big vulnerability. As we'll see, there can be exceptions, but they're exceptions for a reason. Requirement number six, developing securely, is all about mitigating vulnerabilities in developed applications and off-the-shelf ones as well. It's about having a secure software development lifecycle, as well as applying patches both for your applications and off-the-shelf ones in a timely manner. Critical patches within one month and other patches within two to three months. This is usually one of the hardest requirements to achieve. And for a very funny reason, which is that most developers don't care about security. They want to code features. They're excited by features. So they have to be trained in terms of how to avoid all common vulnerabilities, from cross-site scripting to buffer overflows, and do this for every single application that is developed in every single version that is released. And besides, the initial deployment of applications Changes to these must also be managed, with rollback policies in case of problematic changes, and so on. Requirement 7, need to know access, is all about restrictive access control, and I mean both digital and physical. It's based on something called the principle of least privilege, the least permissions possible for a user to perform something. If possible, no permissions. So. Take any employee if they can perform their job function by not knowing the full personal account number, but just a masked version, such as the six first digits and the last four, then reduce what they have access to. Or can they even do their whole job without access to card data at all? Then remove it. That's the logic. This minimizes access to cardholder data by users, and naturally, any changes to roles and their permissions must be managed through a formal change management process. Requirement 8, identifying access, is all about non-repudiation and accountability. In other words, if something happens, you want to identify the human point of failure. You don't want a situation, for example, where a vulnerability was exposed by your general guest account or admin account but you do want a situation where it was exposed by your employee David, for example, and that he used multi-factor authentication to log in, so you really know it was him. That's what this requirement is about. So it includes sub-requirements such as unique user IDs, no group users, no shared users, and properly removing all the employees. It also includes other measures such as strong password practices, locking up someone's account on a certain number of failed attempts, and automatic logouts after a period of inactivity, such as 15 minutes. It also includes the usage of strong authentication measures that are unique to the person, so multi-factor authentication, FOBs, smart cards, badges, and so on, to make sure that it's really this person. Requirement number nine is about restricting physical access. It's the real-world equivalent of requirement seven. Requirement seven was about limiting digital access, and this one is about limiting physical access, both to devices and people. It's about CCTV, locked rooms, safes, restricted areas, and more. The goal is to prevent attackers from both tampering with your devices using keyloggers, or placing skimmers on your POS devices, or tampering with your people by using social engineering. It also includes procedures for safe storage of media, safe transportation, 
and safe disposal. So if you have a hard drive with cardholder data, how secure is it? What are the rules for transporting it, especially outside the premises? And when disposed of, do you have a certificate for that? And so on. Requirement number 10 is about monitoring networks. Or in simpler terms, it's about constant logging. If an attack occurs, you want to know when and you want to know where. There are specific elements of data that must be stored for each log entry, such as the user, the type of operation, and so on, as well as specific events that always must be logged, including all intrusion attempts, all admin actions, all operations with cardholder data, and more. The time for these logs must be synchronized using one mechanism. This is to facilitate interpretation of chains of events across different machines, because if they're off by even one minute, it's going to be very confusing to reconcile those logs. It also includes the usage of FIM, or File Integrity Management Solutions, because attackers change logs, so it's crucial to know if that occurred. Logs should also be backed up in a secure location as close to real time as possible to prevent tampering to begin with. Requirement 11 is about testing regularly both your networks and your systems to identify vulnerabilities and prevent attacks. This means, for example, performing both internal and external tests. For example, doing an audit of all access points, both legitimate and rogue ones. Or, for example, doing a periodic audit of all IP addresses in your network and seeing how they changed since last time. It also includes both vulnerability scanning and penetration testing. So vulnerability scanning will be more general and will just tell you your weak points, while penetration testing is much more hands-on and specific to the company and will simulate a real attack. It's important to note that the assessor for these scans must be qualified, which is what the PCI DSS defines as an ASV, or Approved Scanning Vendor. And here's the key, they can be someone internal or external to your company as long as they are qualified. And finally, requirement 12 about an information security policy is the only requirement that's not about technology, but management. It's about having pervasive controls at all levels. Seriously, it touches all roles, all systems, and all levels that deal with cardholder data. It includes, for example, technology usage policies. What technology can be used? What type of server? What type of operating system? What type of antivirus software? What's the acceptable use for those computers and servers? So, for example, telling employees that they can't watch pirated movies on company computers, as well as having rules for that selection, and also, naturally, managing those assets. It also includes, for example, employee screening, having yearly background checks and NDAs on the cardholder data. And one of the most important points is having incident management procedures, incident response, so having people available 24-7, having a process, having a clear set of actions, and testing these yearly, not just having them on paper. These 12 requirements can seem complex to tackle, and we'll take a look at each one of them in detail in their own lesson. But in order to simplify things even more, I use a personal mnemonic of four statements starting with keep it that simplify them. So for example, each requirement is either about keeping it locked, keeping it blocked, keeping it identified, or keeping it updated. So all of the 12 requirements will fit, in some way, this mnemonic. So keeping it locked is about preventing access, having safe, encrypted, secure data, secure media, isolated physical locations, and so on. It's literally locked, so it can't be accessed. Keeping it blocked is about blocking vulnerabilities, blocking access to traffic, blocking unauthorized access, blocking malware, and so on. The attacker can't reach it. Keeping it identified is about identifying accesses in users, knowing who did what in all types of systems. And keeping it updated 
is about making sure that you are up to date on protection, keeping systems updated, keeping antivirus updated, keeping risk assessment updated, keeping your software tests updated in terms of development, keeping your vulnerability testing updated, keeping your logs updated, and so on. So we can easily match each requirement to this mnemonic. In fact, some requirements could certainly be more than one. So number one, keep a firewall. Definitely keep it blocked, blocking traffic. Requirement number two about no defaults is keeping it blocked as well, blocking vulnerabilities and exploits. Requirement number three, protect stored data, is about keeping it locked, making sure the data is locked digitally. Requirement number four is keep it locked for the same reason. The data can't be accessed. Requirement number five, prevent malware, is about keeping it blocked, blocking malware and viruses. Requirement six, develop securely, is about keeping it blocked, blocking vulnerabilities and exploits, specifically those that your developers may be causing themselves. Requirement number seven, need to know access, is about keeping it blocked, blocking access from roles that don't have permission. Requirement number eight, identify access, is keeping it identified, knowing exactly who is doing what in your systems. Requirement number nine, restricting physical access, is keeping it blocked, blocking physical access to your premises and data. Requirement number 10, monitoring networks, is about keeping it identified, identifying actions, events, timestamps. Requirement number 11, Testing regularly is about keeping it updated, being updated on risk assessment, vulnerability auditing, and test results. You could argue that it should be keep it blocked because you're blocking access from attackers. But I think the most important component of this requirement is doing it frequently because a vulnerability scan from two years ago is not going to help you. And finally, requirement 12 about an information security policy is about keeping it identified, identifying owners, roles, responsibilities, users for every area of the organization. Just to close the lesson, out of curiosity, there are six goals in PCI DSS, at least as a version 3.2.1. And in this course, we are going to focus on the requirements and not the goals. But let me just illustrate the relationship between them in a minute. So goal number one is to build and maintain a secure network and systems, and this includes two requirements. Requirement one, about keeping a firewall, and requirement two, about not having defaults in your system. Goal number two is about protecting cardholder data, and it includes requirements three, about protecting stored data, and requirement four, about protecting transmitted data. Goal number three, is about maintaining a vulnerability management program. And this both includes requirement five, so no malware, and requirement six, develop securely. So no vulnerabilities from viruses and no vulnerabilities from your own applications. Goal number four is about implementing strong access control measures. And it includes three requirements. Requirement seven is about need to know access. Requirement eight is about identifying access, unique IDs, and so on. While requirement nine is about restricting physical access. Then, goal number five is about regularly monitoring and testing networks. And this includes requirement number 10, monitor networks, which is about logging, as well as requirement 11, test regularly, which is about vulnerability scanning, penetration testing, and intrusion prevention. And finally, the last goal is to maintain an information security policy. And its only requirement has pretty much the same name, having an information security policy across the whole organization. What are some examples? The first is that we will have policies everywhere. You will notice this as we examine the different requirements. But one of the most pervasive elements is having policies policies to update the antivirus, policies for secure development, policies for access control, and more. In every requirement, you will see that the last sub-requirement says document and enforce these procedures. Then, minimizing scope. 
One of the most important things that an organization can do is to minimize the scope of their card data environment. Remember, the organization must only comply with the PCI DSS in terms of the card data environment. So the more that organizations can reduce the scope of the CVE, the less work they will have, because the less they have to comply with. Then, as you're probably guessing, the PCI DSS are very comprehensive and full. They are a true cybersecurity to the force. They impose checks on physical and logical access, on system and network security, data management, encryption key management, and many other areas. What are our key takeaways here? The first is that the 12 requirements of the PCI DSS framework cover all areas of cybersecurity, from vulnerability scanning and protection, to data encryption, to access control, and more. Then, many of the requirements are related and complementary. They mirror each other. For example, requirements 3 and 4, protect stored data and protect transmitted data. Or requirements 7 and 9, restrict logical access and restrict physical access, among others. And finally, keep in mind the four keypads mnemonic. This can help in memorizing every requirement. So each requirement either keeps it blocked, keeps it locked, keeps it identified, or keeps it updated. So as you see, these are the 12 requirements that we are going to cover. Each one of them can benefit from a simplified name, keep a firewall, know the faults, and so on. And besides this, you can use the mnemonic of keep it blocked, keep it locked, keep it identified, or keep it updated to really memorize these requirements more easily.